Alrighty, God is good. In the very early hours of this morning, the word of the Lord came to me. You know, there is a difference between God telling you, do not be afraid, and God asking you, why are you afraid? You see, because when God tells you, do not be afraid, he is issuing a command. But there are certain times we are in, even though you think you have it all together, even though you feel fired up in the spirit, certain things will happen and then you lose your cool. And when that happens, the Lord would ask you, why are you afraid? Let's be seated. And I want to begin this evening by somewhat attempting to help us answer the question, why are you afraid? You see, quite often the reason why that question comes is because God already knows that your confidence is being challenged. It's because God already knows that you are not where you were in terms of being fully resolute in your faith. And God asks that question quite often because he wants to help you expose your level of confidence. You see, the Bible says that if your strength fails in the day of adversity, then that means your strength is indeed small. That's what the Word of God says, that when adversity comes and you find that your strength does not measure up to the adversity, it is just a way of God letting you know there's more work to be done. You understand what I mean? And so when the Lord is asking you, why are you afraid? You need to be able to identify a new challenge or a new level of difficulty that wasn't there before so that you can measure it and say, okay, this is where the devil is coming out. I need to go higher. You understand what I mean? And so I know quite often we want to do what God says because God commands us not to be afraid. But every now and again, you find yourself sometimes waking up from a dream. And you wake up from a dream and you feel like your heart is racing. God hasn't left you because he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But he wants you to identify a new trend in what the enemy is doing. He wants you to identify a new tactic that the enemy is bringing to bear because it is part of your equipping as a saint to constantly measure and be aware of where the enemy is at against you. Praise the Lord. This is what the word of the Lord says. The word of the Lord says, do not be ignorant of the devices of the crafty. When the enemy comes in like a flood, like a flood, the Bible says the Lord will raise a standard. I mean, you can't raise a standard against what level you do not even know. What if the enemy is at level six and you're not aware of it and you think, you know what? I have a feeling that the devil is at level four. I'm gonna just go to five. You will still be behind. You will still fall short of the glory of God. And so I want to encourage you that when you find yourself in that situation wherein the Lord is asking you, why are you afraid? You need to identify exactly what it is that the Lord is revealing through that question. And we're going to pray in just a moment. But I would... Okay, let me show you something real quick. Um, let me show you something real quick. Matthew chapter 4. We're going to read Matthew chapter 4 and then we're going to pray. Uh, Matthew chapter 4 details the account of Satan when he tempted Jesus or the account of Jesus being tempted by Satan. Verse 1 says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now many people have a problem with this particular verse one, that Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. But the same Jesus taught his disciples to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. There seems to be a kind of conflict here. If the Holy Spirit led you, to be tempted, why don't you want me to be tempted? Why, what are you protecting me against? 
Let us pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you because gloriously the entrance of your word brings light and it brings understanding unto the simple. Lord, let us be ready to receive in humility your word today. Your implanted word, your engrafted word by revelation and by the ministry of your Holy Spirit is coming forth today. This very hour, let our hearts open to receive because it brings understanding to the simple, not to the ones who think they already know it all. And so Lord, let us be ready to unlearn the things that we have once held dear that may not be the truth of the times that we're in by your word. Let us be willing, Father, to divorce ourselves from the traditions that we have held to for so long and perhaps for too long so that we can see clearly what you are saying unto your church and that we may obey and, and further incline our ears for more instructions in righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. That is very critical. You know, it is very critical for us to listen and then be further inclined. You know, because some of us, we hear one thing and then we want to run with it without having a full message. You remember that guy in the Bible? I can't remember his name. That is one of those um, Old Testament stories that not many people refer to. And so you often forget it if you don't read it yourself. He was somewhere where an instruction was being given. And as soon as it was said, we need somebody to go to the king and say this. He hit the ground. And he ran and overtook everybody. And when he got there, all he could do was, oh, there's a message for you. And they were like, okay, what's the message? <sighs> there's a message for you. <sighs> he was there trying to catch his breath when the real messenger came with a word from the Lord. Many of us are like that. We have a glimpse of what God wants to do with us and through us. And we do not wait for the remainder of the message and we'll run. You know, some of us, we have heard that God wants to use us to reshape this nation, but you don't hear how he wants to do it. You just hear the what and you start to run. The Bible says, yes, the, 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 the why is the wisdom, the what is the knowledge. And sometimes God, first of all, tells you what he wants you to do, but he doesn't want you to run with it until you have heard why he wants you to do it and how he wants you to do it. The Bible says of all those three things, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, what do you do? You get understanding. Because if you do not know how, which is the question that understanding comes to answer, you may just think that you've got it figured out. And then you go and, and register to become the congressman because you think that is how you're going to change the nation and God is like well you didn't wait to hear how I want you to do it maybe God just wants you to be an intercessor maybe God wants you to move to somewhere far away so that you don't have the distractions of people's opinion so that you can hear expressly from God the things that need to be addressed in the place of prayer but many of us, the moment we hear that God wants to use us to make a change in the nation, then you subscribe to all of the news outlets. If I'm going to help God change this nation, I need to know what is going on in this nation. What is going on in this nation is not coming from the pundits. What is going on in this nation can only be truly seen through the eyes of God. You see, because we are living in the time of the great deception and the forerunner to the Antichrist is called the false prophet. Just like John the Baptist was the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Antichrist himself has a forerunner. And the forerunner to the false prophet is who? The false, to, to the Antichrist is the false prophet. And the false prophet, his mission is to prophesy falsely. I think that English is pretty basic. And how does the world communicate? The world communicates using mass communication. You see, the difference between the way God communicates and the way Satan communicates is that God speaks to the heart of individuals. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is not going to be built on general revelation. It's not going to be built on common exposition. But the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has been made clear by himself will be built upon the rock of personal revelation. We have come to a time wherein once again the Bible says his people will be captives in Babylon. 
This new Babylon is called Mystery Babylon because it's a Babylon that hadn't been seen before by the prophets. So they called it the Mystery Babylon. And what is the meaning of Babylon? Babylon is where we get the concept or comes from the concept of, of Babel. And Babel means confusion by mixing. And what does that mean? Everything is muddled up and thrown at the people so that no one can sift through and know that which is the truth. It is a strategy of the enemy to keep people busy and occupied without being equipped. And so if you want to know what is going on, you cannot go to Medea, media. I've told you before, the word media is of similar origin to the word Medea, which is the goddess of enchantment. A lot of what enchants us, a lot of what hypnotizes us are things that are muddled up. And you know the reason why you get hypnotized or you get, uh, what's the word? Jesus used the word caroused. The reason why we're so taken by the things of the world and by the sorcery of the enemy is because there is always an element of truth in what the enemy is packaging. And you are designed to seek the truth. It's like when someone holds a ball in front of your eyes and they keep swinging it, you get hypnotized because you're trying to follow that which is the substance. But because the substance is not steady, it has the ability to hypnotize. And that's why Jesus says that they will be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. He didn't say they will be tossed to and fro by lies. He says every wind of doctrine. But a doctrine becomes a lie that is capable of deceiving and, and hypnotizing when it is not steadied on the truth. And so that is the reason why you need to wait for the how of God. Because the how of God is not likely to be the how that you come up with. Have you looked through scriptures and seen that almost everybody God calls had an idea of exactly how to do what God is saying? And that is the reason why quite often they're always like, God, I can't do it. And God is always like, why? Why not? Because of this, because of that. And God says, but what if I don't want to do it that way? And the reason why many of them will say, oh, I am the least in my father's house is because their psyche tells them for you to make such a difference, you have to come from royalty. You have to have recognition. You have to be a celebrity. You have to be a government official. You have to be an elected person into office. And God is saying, no, you can be the least in your father's house. I'm not using your pedigree to do this. I am using the anointing. You understand what I mean? Every single one of us, why do we always have our own preconceived ideas? We are men made in the image and in the likeness of God. We are never void of house. We always have our own ideas. Because we are made to contain God and until we have as much of him and as is needed per time, we are not empty vessels. We are not vacuums. Nature, by God's design, abhors a vacuum. Nature does not permit vacuums. And so until you have as much of God as is needed, there will be that much of you on the inside of you, which includes your way of thinking, your way of assessing situations, your way of judging people. Your way of worship, and that's why a lot of people worship themselves. If they come to church and the music does not suit their taste, then they don't care if God has been worshipped or not. They're going somewhere else. Because they, have, they are still sitting on the throne of their hearts. So as human beings, you need to recognize that when God says, I am making you in my image and in my likeness, he meant it. He was very serious. So if God is not sitting on that throne, someone is. And quite often, it is you. Because Satan... The word Satan means adversary. And that is the reason why from time to time, the Bible will make very clear which Satan he is, is being referred to. Look at Revelations. When John was talking about Satan, he says that serpent of old. He was being very clear that I'm talking about the furry serpent. He says I'm talking about the dragon. So there are times wherein you hear the word Satan and you're just thinking of Lucifer or you hear the word Satan and you're just thinking of the dragon. Whereas the Satan might be you. The opposition might be you. When Peter told Jesus, you're not going to die, what did Jesus say? Jesus says, get thee behind me, oh Satan. He was saying, you are now becoming an opposition to my fulfilling of destiny. And so it is critical for us to understand that sometimes self is the beast. Sometimes we have to understand that. And the way to understand that is to first of all recognize that indeed we have every ability and every propensity to attempt to be God unto ourselves. How come the new age mentality is spreading so fast? Because it sounds so good to people. 
People are like, yeah, I've always felt like I, I was the God. Well, in a way, you are made in his image and in his likeness, so you're not wrong in terms of your assessment of your makeup, but you are just not right in terms of your understanding of your ability and the need to be able to surrender all that makeup to his glory. You see, because at the end of the day, let me, let me just tell you one thing here. Come with me. Let me show you something in Genesis chapter 1 verse 17. And then we're going to come back. Let me put my um, bookmark in here. I'll just use my phone for now. Do you think? Let's do this right. And then we'll go to Genesis chapter 1 verse 17. I mean, look at what it says in verse 17 of Genesis chapter 1. The Bible says, God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. When Jesus says to his disciples that you are the light and the salt, he was letting them know that they are the stars. And where are stars? Stars are up there. And many of us, a lot of what we look up to when we think we're looking up to God is self. Let me explain that. You see, when you look up, what do you see? You see the stars. They're very evident because they twinkle through the dark of night. The way this works in our day-to-day -day lives is that quite often when we pray, sometimes we're not praying to God, we're praying to self. You have to learn how to not stop at the star level to project beyond the stars to the one who sits in the third heavens. Because sometimes when you're praying, you're only praying th things that you can do yourself. <laughs> Let me tell you something. What, how do many people pray? People identify something that needs to be done. God is sending you to go and minister somewhere. And what is your prayer? Your prayer most times is not about how you will continue to rid yourself of yourself so that you can decrease and he can increase so as long as you are doing that, you can arrive at the place of the fulfillment of that assignment in the fullness of the power of God as opposed to the fullness of your own self. We don't pray such prayers quite often. You know what we're praying about? We're asking God, say, Father, I, you've sent me to go to this place I really wanna go, so right now, let this business opportunity go through so that I can make money to buy the ticket. You are praying to yourself because what you're asking for is that you will become the provider for that assignment. What you are asking for is that you become the enabler of that mission. It is the same thing as looking up and seeing yourself in the stars and feeling very conceited and say, yes, I got this. But we don't know that we do that by design because we are like the stars that are in the firmament of the heavens. But God is not in the firmament. He is above the firmament. And what that means is you need to be able to look up and see through what is above you to the one who is above you. Because if he is the one that is above me, then my focus should be on how to make myself more available because he doesn't need my ability, he needs my availability. Many times, we fall for that temptation because we don't fully understand the way that he made us. You know, some of the biggest problems that we face as human beings is that we are not in full awareness of our privileges. We don't know the nature of the privileges that we have, and that is the reason why those things that are supposed to be blessings in our lives cause us a lot of stress. Things that God has blessed you with can easily become the stumbling block. God blesses you with a wonderful voice. You can sing, but now that is the reason why you become more proud than everybody else. God has given you children so that you can raise them in the admonition of the things of God. But every time you hear the news and you hear what's going on with children, you start to panic over a blessing. You see, understanding your privilege as a believer is very critical to you 
learning the principles of humility and understanding the rudiments of godliness. Because if you don't know that the privileges that you have are there, they could easily be presented to you by Satan as enablement. Divine enablement. Satan is like, man, you don't have to hang, around, hang out with those people. You can sing better than them. And then you start to think about yourself differently. When the Bible says, let no one think of himself more highly than he ought to. Understanding your privilege is very key. Because at the end of the day, the moment you understand that all of the privilege that I have is so that I can make myself more available to God, then it changes everything. By so doing, you present your bodies unto God, a living sacrifice that is holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. And with that is all stuck. Um, a nugget or a prologue to get us started. Now let's go back to Matthew chapter four. One of the things that I want to share with us today is, this might become a series if the Lord has it so, but at least for today, we will begin to understand the spiritual warfare. You see, we're not fighting as we should. Many of us are fighting randomly. And Paul says, I do not run as one that just beats the air. I do not fight as one that is just throwing empty punches. He said, I typically gain focus before I swing a punch. He says, I have my eyes set on the mark of the prize. You see, the ability to be able to focus on the enemy was what determines whether you win or you lose. Imagine when David was faced with Goliath. If he was just randomly swinging or slinging rather at Goliath, he could have hit Goliath in the chest and Goliath would have just done that because the Bible says that there was no part of his being that was exposed except for his forehead why was Goliath's forehead exposed because there was no way Goliath in his thinking would have thought any one of those little rats could get to that level and that is exactly why mystery Babylon will fall that is the reason why the enemy of the church will fall simply because we have so little in their eyes and we have been so rendered, uh, what's the word, powerless from their perspective that there are certain things that they have left open because they just never thought we would get there. But God is full of surprises every now and again because there was no way Pharaoh could have thought that the Red Sea would open. <laughs> you see, that's the reason why I like the predicament that we're in. You know, the Bible says that even Jesus was telling, in Revelations, he told John, <laughs> he said, don't worry, I see how disadvantaged you are. He says, I see your poverty. I see all the persecution. He says, I see every one of those things. He said, but from my perspective, he says, that is richness. It looks like deprivation. He said, but from where I stand, he says, that is a good thing. He said, because to you, where you're at, and from the perspective of the world, you are poor. He said, but from where I am, you are rich. Simply because your lack of strength gives the enemy false confidence in their own strength. And from heaven's perspective, that leaves plenty of room for God to stretch his hand. Revelation chapter 2, if you want to go and look deeply or more closely at that concept. But today, I want to get us started on spiritual warfare. I want us to recognize the enemy that we're fighting and how to position ourselves to overcome the enemy. So when we read Matthew chapter 4 verse 1, like I told you, several people have an issue with the fact that Jesus himself was led by the Holy Spirit to be tempted, but we are being told to pray against temptation. So we have to recognize that in this case, there must be two or more kinds of temptations. There is a kind of temptation that is okay for you to be led into by the Holy Spirit, but there are other temptations that you need to pray against. Because the word of God does not contradict itself. So when you see God saying, I am leading you by my spirit into temptation, and then afterwards just pray that you are not led into temptations, rather than you thinking that God is conflicted in himself, you need to recognize that, okay, there must be two separate things or more. Can I give you another, another very good example? In the book of Proverbs, the Bible says, do not answer a fool according to his foolishness. But in the same breath, the very next line, what does it say? It says, answer a fool according to his foolishness so that he doesn't begin to think wise in himself. 
When I first read that or when I started reading the Bible, I would look at that and I would think to myself, so God, can you please make up your mind? Which one do you want me to do? Do you want me to answer the fool? Or do you want me not to answer the fool? And so that means there are two different kinds of answers that we're looking at. Because the fool is the fool. Foolishness is foolishness. But then the answer has to be what differs between these two scenarios. Because God does not conflict. The Bible says he is light. And with him there is no variableness, no shadow of turning. God does not contradict himself. Neither does he ever change his mind. The Bible says God is not a man that he should repent. Neither is he the son of man that he should lie. And so when he says it, but someone is like, oh, but I've seen situations where God says, oh, I'm going to destroy these people, and then afterwards he doesn't destroy them. No, he doesn't change his mind, but he just lets you know that there are options. He said, I said before you this day, life and death, choose life that you may live. And so initially, these people were heading toward death like the people of Nineveh. And God was like, I'm going to send them Jonah to go and minister to them. If they would hearken to the voice of Jonah and repent, then they will be saved. God did not change his mind from destroying them. He just said what one option is and described what the other is. And typically what I've come to learn is that when God gives you what seems to be two options, in reality it is one. The other one is the absence of the other. You know, like people have come to know that there is no darkness. Because the Bible says that darkness is nothing. How do we know that? In the beginning, the Bible says God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep. So is darkness a thing? No. Because the Bible says that the earth was void. To be void means to be empty. So if darkness was there, that means darkness is not a thing. Because God says this thing is zero. So if it is zero, whatever is in that thing also equates to zero. You can multiply the biggest number that you can find in the world against zero. What do you get? Zero. $500 million multiplied by zero is zero. And that is the reason why many people are broke because they don't understand that math. You understand what I mean? And so darkness is nothing. So what is darkness? Darkness is the absence of light. The moment you withdraw light from this room, darkness suddenly appears. I was watching the debate between two scientists the other day, about two days ago, and they were trying, one was trying to convince the other that darkness travels faster than light. Because he says when you switch on the light, darkness must travel faster than light for us to be able to see the light. So basically what he was trying to prove was that light is traveling this way. And the only reason why you can see the light is because the darkness that was occupying that space is moving away faster. Let me borrow the two of you and explain this. Alan and Brother Matthew, can you come up here? Let me explain. Let me just show you exactly what this looks like from God's perspective. I want you to stand in here. You're wearing a black shirt, so you're going to be darkness. You're wearing a white shirt, you'll be light. Okay, we'll use the shirt so that nobody gets offended. Why don't you stand here? Brother Matthew, no, no, you stand, I like the way you were standing, but face the crowd, face everybody, and then you stand here behind him, all right? Alan, step back a little bit. No, no, step back properly, because I want you to move that way without hitting the speakers. Okay, I want you to stay where you're at. Alan, move sideways. When Alan moved, you saw Matthew. Alan, come back. Now, Brother Matthew, move together with Alan. Three, two, one, go. Do you see Matthew? No, because Alan is moving at the same speed. So this particular scientist was saying that when you switch on the light, the reason why we see Matthew, so Matthew, I want you to take one step. I want you to take two quick steps. So let's go. Three, two, one. Brother Matthew is trying to help me. Don't worry. Move in the same direction. I say, my science will work. I've thought about it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you move in the same direction. One step. You take two very quick steps. Three, two, one. I said one step, I didn't say one jump. Brother Matthew, oh yeah, yeah. So one step, and you take two quick steps, alrighty. So three, two, one. Alan, is that two? Okay, Alan, please go to your seat. You're, you're a bad example today. No, Brother Matthew, stand behind me. So this is what happens. Brother Matthew, you take one step. Alrighty, three, two, one. I take two steps. Now you can see the light, because the darkness moved quicker than the light. So that was what they were trying to prove. Thank you, Brother Matthew. Oh, yes. 
Alan, you need to go to the school of examples. The last time I had him up here, I said, behold, an example of a believer. And today, he can't even take two steps. But the reality of that is, that is not science. It's not science. Because at the end of the day, the way Jesus describes it, in John chapter 1, Jesus says the light shines forth in darkness, and the darkness cannot comprehend it. The reason why you see the light is not because the darkness is there, standing in front of the light. There is no darkness. It is just the absence of light. So there was no Alan moving and blocking Matthew. The reason why you didn't see Matthew, or you don't see Matthew, is because he's not there yet. But the moment he appears, there is no darkness. Darkness gets to be exposed as being nothing in the first place. Does that make sense? Alrighty. So, uh, what, how did we even get into light and darkness again? Okay, anyway, I was talking to you about things that somewhat are immutable. In the sense that they are just what they are, they do not change. And so when God speaks and he gives you an option, when he says, I set before you this day life and death, he says, choose life that you may live. So the reason why death was an option is because he, he knows that they may not choose life. Anybody who chooses life, death does not even come into the picture. So I said before you, light and darkness. Choose light that you may see. So if you don't choose light, what do you have? No light, which is the meaning of darkness. So those two options in reality, they are just one. You are the one that brings the second option based on the choices that you make. I know that's a little bit of a philosophical digest, but it is important because we need to understand how temptations work. So there are two kinds of temptations. So let me finish the example of foolishness. I mean, not the example of foolishness, the example about responding to foolish people, okay? The Bible says, answer not a fool according to his folly. But then it says, answer a fool so that he doesn't continue to mistake his folly for wisdom. So that he doesn't think that he's wise. So what does it mean to not answer a fool according to his folly? When Jesus was being tested by Pharisees and Sadducees, they will come and present an argument and Jesus will not answer them according to their argument. He will answer them by wisdom. So when the Sadducees came to Jesus, the Sadducees came to Jesus because they wanted to expose the fact that they do not believe in resurrection. But what they did was they said, hey Jesus, this man that we once knew, he married a wife and then he died. And then the wife married another one of his brothers and he died. And then up to like five of them had the same woman. And they were like, so in the resurrection, whose wife is it? Now, to answer them according to their folly, We'll be trying to say something like this to them. Well, I guess it has to be the first guy because in the resurrection he's no longer dead so that he can have his wife. The Bible says do not try to answer them according to their foolishness because their foolishness is a trap. You can't get out of it. The foolishness is a trap. You can't get out of it. So don't fall for that trap. You answer them though so that they don't continue to think that they're wise in their own eyes. So you see what, how the word of God operates? Do not answer a fool, but also answer a fool. But God makes it very clear. How do you not answer a fool? According to their folly. But how do you answer them? By the wisdom of God. And so Jesus turned around and said to them, he says, well, I tell you that in the resurrection that y'all will be like the angels of God who do not marry or get given in marriages. <laughs> and that very moment, in all their wisdom, their wisdom was turned into foolishness. Do you know that the Bible says that God takes delight in turning the wisdom of the wicked to foolishness? He doesn't take their wisdom from them. They're still holding that wisdom and it suddenly becomes foolishness. So they're standing there like idiots. That is what shame is. Shame is when God allows for that which you are glorifying above God to turn into dust. And then you're like, Ooh, is this what I've been holding all this while? So, the same thing applies to temptations. So when Jesus says, when the Bible says Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted of Satan, that is the kind of temptation that we pray for. That is the kind of temptation that we, that we hope to grow into receiving. Jesus said something before he was led into the wilderness. 
John the Baptist said to him, he says, but I don't think I should be baptizing you. I mean, come on, you're the, you're the chief here. You're the big boy. He says, I can't even lace your sandal strap. I can't fasten the strap of your shoes or your, what do you call it? I know you people don't use laces here, but what do you, you use strap, the sandal strap? Yeah, okay. He said, I can't. I'm, you're that far, you're that high up. And what did Jesus say? Jesus says, you better get on with it because we have to fulfill all righteousness. Wouldn't you think that somebody who fulfills all righteousness will receive a commendation and then get a promotion? Well, he got the commendation because as soon as he said that and he was dipped in the water, the Bible says God tore open the heavens and gave a commendation. He says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But the commendation did not immediately get followed by a promotion. It was followed by temptation. It's like when you go to school and you receive tuition. Tuition doesn't automatically result in the promotion. You have tuition and then you have examination. We want to see how much of what we have given to you, you have retained. Because let me tell you something, what determines the prosperity of a man's life is not the abundance of that which is given to him. It is actually the measure of that which he retains. It rains, it can rain all over Georgia. And yet, the rain doesn't do us any good. If we don't plant seeds or fields that the rain will water, if you don't bring out buckets and containers to retain the water for drinking and other purposes later, you continue to pay for water. Even though it's freely given from heaven, but because you do not prepare yourself to retain the blessing when it comes out of heaven, then someone else will benefit from your lack of preparedness. Because the people who sell you the water, they're collecting it from the rain. So what determines what you have is not what you receive, it is what you keep. We know that simple math because you know you can make a lot of money and still be broke. We know a guy by the name of Mike a while ago who made a lot of money from boxing. And now he's trying to do podcasts to pay his bill. What does that mean? <laughs> you have to keep. And that is the reason why God, that, see, Michelle, that is the reason why God tests us. Because he wants it to be known that we are ready for that promotion. And so that particular kind of temptation is what is examination. Not so that you can be found wanting, but so that you can be found ready. And so, let me just finish the distinction between the two temptations because that's not what I really want to go into, but I believe it's going to help us to be able to receive the rest of the text once we've resolved that uh, conflict. The other kind of temptation, however, are things that God has not put along your path to reveal the blessing and the equipping that he has put inside of you, but things that life and other opposing forces have thrown at you to distract you from your assignment. Now those temptations are of three types, or maybe types is not a word. They're of three different natures. One of them is called what? The pride of life. The other one is called the lust of the eyes. And the other one is called, the third one is called the lust of the flesh. Those three things are the three natures that sin takes in the life or temptation takes in the life of a man and woman. When I say man, I'm talking about humanity in general. And so a lot of what causes us to sin is the pride of life. Unforgiveness is mostly rooted in the pride of life. She did all of that to me and I will be the one to go and apologize. God forbid. That is the pride of life. You look at somebody and they have such a lovely dress that you wish you had. And rather than celebrating them and thanking God for how well the dress looks on them, because you wish it was on you, the lust of your eyes would not allow for you to become envious. And now you're praying against them rather than praying for them. You understand what I mean? You see, you see your, neighbor's, your neighbor's wife is out in the yard weeding grass and you're just like, oh, I wish that was my wife. The lust of the eyes. And then there is also the lust of the flesh, wherein there are certain things that make you feel a certain way in your flesh. And even though God is telling you, let go of that thing, you're like, oh, but it makes me feel good. And that is how people end up being addicted to substances because their flesh is lusting after it. Their senses are not lusting after it because they're sensible enough to know that this thing destroys. But then they listen to the dictates of their flesh. Actually, we can use that illustration to break this thing down. I think it might actually be simpler than another approach. 
And so now we know that there are two different types of temptations. You pray, like Jesus says, Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Those two prayers go hand in hand. Because even though God is not leading you into temptation, evil will try to bring that temptation wherever God leads. It's like, wow, we thought he was going to come back here. Okay, but he didn't. So let's go and find him. So God has to deliver you from both of them. So do we all get the difference between the two kinds of temptations? Now let's go back to Matthew chapter 4. He says that Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, by the Spirit, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterward, he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Rule number one of spiritual warfare is to not expose yourself. Let me say this, do not what? Expose yourself. You know what David was trying to, what the devil was trying to do? The devil looked at Jesus and he was like, okay, he's hungry. He's probably never been this hungry all his life. He says, but at the end of the day, you, we, we heard about you recently, that the heavens were opened and God said, you are my son. So if truly you are the son of God, why don't you turn these stones into bread? Now, the devil was making the argument about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ by God's authority. Again, do not answer a fool according to his folly. Jesus did not try to convince the devil that he was the son of God. Many of us, what happens is the enemy draws us out to battle and we expose ourselves. He was expecting Jesus to come out and say, what do you mean? Did you not hear when my father said I was the son of God? No, Jesus recognized that no, that is a non-issue. I don't have to prove anything that God has already said. I don't. I don't have to prove to anybody what God has already said. Let me tell you how that works when it comes to healing in your flesh. Quite often, we try to prove to ourselves that God is truly the healer. Because after you pray, you're like, is my temperature getting better now? You understand what I mean? But God says that I am the Lord that heals you. Once he has already said it, you don't have to question it. Don't put, a period, don't put a question mark where God has put a period. Just believe it. Roll over and sleep. I was telling my wife that I woke up from a dream in the middle of the night and it was intense warfare. I didn't like it. So I stayed up for almost an hour. I was analyzing every entity that was in the dream. I knew it was warfare. I knew what they were coming after. At least that much I knew. Because when I was going to bed before I slept, I knew what the Lord told me to do. That I did. The Lord told me certain things to do. So I got downstairs and was like, okay, you do this, you do this, you do that. And I did it. And as soon as I did it, minutes into obeying what the Lord had said, the presence of the Lord filled the room where I was. I found myself in the company of innumerable angels. Innumerable because there was variety of of tradition amongst the angels. The songs I was, I was singing, they were very different. The dances I was doing before the Lord were very different. And so I knew where I was and I knew certain things that transpired in that meeting. I was given an opportunity to ask for certain things and I was told that they would be mine if I would ask for it. And so I, I wasn't surprised necessarily when the opposition came in the dream. I knew what they were after, but for some reason I still wanted to analyze the situation. I was analyzing every entity, every move. Why did they come? Why did I do that? Why did this happen? I was doing all of that. The first dream, I didn't get anything out of it. I went back to sleep. The same dream, but with different characters, different scenarios. It was almost like the dream of Pharaoh. He saw the wheat and then he saw the cows. Same dream, but different scenarios. So that was what happened to me. I had the same dream, but different scenarios. And I'm like, okay. So as soon as I woke up from the second one, I wanted to panic yet again. And then the Lord reminded me, what will be the point of my pondering? Because of what he had already said. So you know what I did? I just went back to sleep. 
I didn't even try to ponder on it. I didn't even try to wonder what else the enemy had because the Lord already said to me, he said, I will not leave you nor forsake you. He said, I am the one who keeps Israel. I don't sleep. I do not slumber. When the Lord has already said that to me, why then do I need to continue to analyze a thing that I know has come to bring me fear? The enemy wanted to bring me fear because I, he knows that I need faith to enjoy that which I had asked for. So guess what? I just believed what the Lord has said. I stayed with what the Lord has said and I went to sleep. You see, Jesus already knew that the Father had said concerning him that you are my beloved son. So when the devil was questioning that, Jesus did not even address that issue because from his perspective, it is a non-issue. So spiritual warfare, of course, you know that on Saturday, was it Saturday, what day is it today? Tuesday, the last minute we had on Saturday, I was speaking to us about certain things when it comes to understanding the part that we have to play, who we are. Your part to play is to just believe. And so when the Lord says, you are my son, you just believe it and you don't question it. That settles it. And so Jesus moved on to the next issue, which was the real temptation. The first one was a distraction. The second thing was a real temptation because he said, you must be hungry. Why don't you turn these stones into bread? Strategy number one, don't forget, don't expose yourself. The devil will try to pull you out. He wanted to draw Jesus into that battle of identity, but Jesus did not engage him in the battle of identity. He did not expose himself unnecessarily. He stayed in his place by avoiding the advances of Satan. There are certain times that what you do best to Satan is to ignore him. You know that I've told you once before that I used to pray every time I have a bad dream, I will get up, oh, shkutu parapa, ubi tupi, I will be praying. And one day, the Lord, I, I had a dream. And when I woke up from the dream, the Lord was like, before you do all of what you do, let me just tell you, let me tell you the characters in that dream. That lion was not there to eat you. That is the lion of Judah. He came to scare away the enemy. And I felt so little. Because I was about to declare a two-hour intercession because of what I saw in the dream. You understand what I mean? And so I had learned from that time on that when I have a dream like that, I don't wake up trying to bind and rebuke. The, no, what do I do? The Lord has given me rest. The Bible says the Lord gives his beloved sleep. So I'm not binding and losing. I just enjoy the peace that he has given to me. You understand what I mean? Because the devil wants to draw you out on the basis of identity. You can't let him. So Jesus went to the other issue because that was one of his favorite things to do. You see, when somebody is trying to question something the Lord has said, the Lord is not going to enjoy that or endure that with you. He just moves on to other things, right? So again, ignoring the enemy is a fantastic strategy. So you wake up from a dream where demons were trying to attack you. When you wake up and you start praying, you are giving them attention. You need to build your faith level to the point where you are confident enough to just to roll around to the other side and sleep. So what you want to do is you want to leave them confused. Like, wait a minute, did you not see us? We were the ones doing this in your dream. It's like, yeah, I don't care. You understand what I mean? Because the Bible says, I am not afraid. What can man do unto me? If the Lord be for me, who can be against me? You want to get to the point wherein you are using the principle of ignoring the enemy, but you do not ignore at all times. Let me say this. Jesus ignored the question about identity because the Lord said. But when it comes to the question of obedience, Jesus said something to Satan. He said to Satan, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He said that I believe largely because of us so that we know what to do. You see, in spiritual warfare, you need to recognize that your flesh can be exploited by Satan because your flesh itself is not on God's side. The Bible says that to be carnally minded is what is death. To be spiritual minded is life. The carnally minded person is enmity against God. The Bible says that the flesh of man is enmity against God and indeed it will always be. So when Jesus comes, what is he, why, why are we rapturing? We're not rapturing to go and live in heaven. We're rapturing to receive our new bodies and come back to the earth and reign gloriously as kings and priests unto our God. And so it is not critical for you to leave this facade to receive a new one that is incorruptible. 
If this flesh can be changed, we don't have, if it can be saved, we don't have to receive a new one. The moment you get born again, time freezes, you will stop aging. But when you get born again, it is not your body that gets born again, it is your spirit that gets born again. When the Bible says, behold, all things are new. If any man be in Christ, is a new creation. All things have passed away and all things have become what? They have become new. And people are like, yeah, but this body didn't get new. The, the scars that I had before I got born again, I can still tell where they're at. I was 5'8 when I got born again. I am still 5'8. What is new about that? You see, it is your spirit. The Bible says the outward man perishes, but the inward man is renewed day by day. But a day will come wherein you will receive a body that matches your spirit. But until you receive that flesh or that facade or that house, the new mansions that matches your body, you're going to have to put up with this one. And that's why you cannot trust it because the Bible says that the arm of flesh will fail because this flesh is always so eager to partner with Satan. And that was why Satan came to attack Jesus first from the angle of his flesh. Because it's like, man, I can use the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh is the most tangible temptation, by the way. You know, I told you about the three natures of, of, the, of temptation. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The lust of the flesh is so tangible because it's usually things that we can feel in our body. You can feel the hunger. You can feel the, the sexual drive. You can feel the need to actually have some kind of pleasure in your body. Because it's, not, it's more tangible. It nags at you. The, the flesh of a man is like Delilah, the nagging woman. You know, Samson was the strongest human being physically that ever lived. But the Bible says that after much nagging, he gave in to Delilah. That means there is a level of nagging that can break the strongest bone and bend the toughest muscles nagging and that's why the Bible says it is better for a man to live in the corner of a rooftop than for him to be in the same house with a nagging woman because no matter how strong you are man of God you cannot survive that thing show me a man that can survive nagging and I will show you an alien a cyborg a robot a droid he's no man because he can't be stronger than Samson and Samson didn't make it <laughs> not my words the word of God so your husband did not send me to you the Lord sent me to him alrighty praise the Lord so here is the deal let's, let's wrap this thing up real quick so when you look at what the Bible says concerning the temptation of Jesus he was dissecting by godly wisdom the attack of the enemy one deflect other respond you know there are times when you raise your shield to deflect a dart of the enemy and there are times when you bring out the sword to jab the enemy. So that was what Jesus did. He deflected the initial dart on identity and then he brought out the jab to attack the enemy. He says man shall not live by bread alone. What he was teaching us about spiritual warfare is to recognize who is on your side and who isn't. The flesh is not on your side because the desires of the flesh are constantly contrary to the things of the spirit. And so if your flesh needs bread and that bread is coming at a time wherein you have recognized that God is leading you by the Spirit, what do you do? You do not give in to the dictates of the flesh because it's a contrary wind. And so what did Jesus say? Jesus says, when I am in a position, when I have come to a place such as I am now, the flesh takes a back seat because I am being led by the Spirit. And what does the Spirit need as food? The Word of God. So in spiritual warfare, you need to, let me give you an example that many of us can relate to and begin to apply. When God gives you a word, you do not need intelligence or reasoning when God gives you a word. What you need is to believe. Let me explain that. You see, there are times wherein God invites you to come and think, to come and reason. He says, come and let us reason together. If your sin be as scarlet, they can be red as snow. There are certain times that God expects you to sit down with a plan and, and, and strategize how you want to get something done. The Bible says the planning of the heart belongs to man, but the Lord directs his steps. The Bible says the man's heart plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. 
So there are times when God expects you to use your, your, your reasoning, your logic. But when you have received a word from God, the logic reasoning takes a back seat. All you have to do is believe that word of God. And so Jesus was hungry. His body needed food. Your body, your flesh, your carnal man is the one that wants to reason out how God will deliver you. But God has said to you that I will come in due season and I will deliver you. All you have to do is just believe that he will deliver you. Try, stop trying to reason your way out of it. When you try to reason your way against what the word of God has said, it becomes worry. You could even take that as a definition of worry. When you're using your God-given privilege of, of the ability to strategize, to plan, and to reason things out logically, when you take all of that ability to try to do what the Word of God says that it takes care of, then you are in worry. But when the Lord says he's already taken care of it, guess what? I don't have to go to reasoning. I don't have to go to bread. I go to the Word of God. And Jesus told Satan, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Satan is saying, Anita, God is telling you to go into the real estate business. So what are you going to do? How much money have you saved? Because it takes a while before people get to sell their first home. And then the devil tries to get you to be reasoning out all of these things. Whereas all you have to do is believe what the Lord has said to you. He says, you shall speak to the wind and they shall bring to you a, a blessing. They will bring to you many blessings. So what do you do? You stay in the place of the word of God. And when that word of God is held on to as you should, guess what? The bread will come. Do you know that at the end of all of that temptation, the Bible says the angels came and they threw a feast for Jesus. Can you imagine? He could have settled for eating bread, stone, that was turned into bread. I mean, can you imagine how tasteless that bread is going to be? And God forbid that you eat the bread and then it becomes stone again when it gets into your belly. And that's the reason why many people sink to the bottom in life because they're carrying such weight that is not intended for their frame. So at the end of the day, how did you overcome opposition? By recognizing that when your spirit is making a move, you do not allow your flesh to interrupt. The flesh will get its own chance to make its move also. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says the spirit was against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. But when the spirit is making a move, you focus on the spirit. He says, no, this is, my flesh did not bring me here. I was led here by the spirit. I do what the spirit says. We're going to wrap up on that note because the other temptations of the Lord Jesus Christ revealed to us an, a, a, other dimensions in spiritual warfare. So maybe this is how it becomes a series. Perhaps we're going to touch on that again on Saturday and, and finish the other two types of temptations. But if you want to study ahead of it on your own, I encourage you, read Matthew chapter 4 and you will see how Satan came against Jesus from the perspective of the lust of his flesh for bread. He came against Jesus from the, from the perspective of the lust of his eyes. He says, look at all of, this, all of these cities I will give to you. And then he came from the perspective of the pride of life by saying, come on, come on Jesus, there's a legion of angels that are watching after you. Give them something to do. Throw yourself down and they'll pick you up. So those are the other kinds of strategies or the other approaches that the enemy takes when it comes to spiritual warfare. And we're going to break those two down, God willing, on Saturday. And then, or maybe a video in between, between now and then, if the Lord leads me that way, that shows to us exactly what the devil does and how we can position ourselves. Now I'm going to wrap it all up by telling you why I am saying this now by the Holy Spirit. I am saying this now by the Holy Spirit simply because Satan is running out of time and the horde of hell is about to be unleashed. A lot of what we have been seeing since around 2020 has been the enemy preparing for the onslaught of the Armageddon. They're preparing for that final battle. But we haven't really been in that battle. It's just preparation. But now we have come to a time wherein we're getting into that battle full on. And what the devil's doing is the devil is bringing the battle from a spirit standpoint. It's a spiritual battle that we're fighting. We may not have any troops coming to knock our doors. We may not have a single missile fired at us in the natural, but the enemy is dropping bombs on us daily in the realm of the spirit. That was what God revealed to John the beloved. He says, I saw and behold, there was war in the heavens. We are experiencing 
preparation for spiritual warfare. But if we don't know how to deal with it, the enemy will continue to deal with us. Let me tell you one of the things that many people will fall for in these last days. Many people will fall for the temptation to be afraid when they should be confident in God because the enemy will show them how deprived they are, how behind they are, how hungry they are, how needy they have become. And the enemy will do all of that so that they can become afraid for their own lives rather than say, thus saith the Lord. We are coming to a time where the Bible says Jesus was hungry. There was no food in his belly. We are coming to a time where in certain things that we have become accustomed to, we may not have access to. We may truly be deprived and still have an appetite for that thing. What are we going to do? Are we going to turn the stones to bread? No. Because once you turn the stone to bread, guess what the devil does? He brings Goliath. Now let me see what you're going to put in your sling because you already ate the stone. You see what I mean? You've already eaten the stone and then he brings Goliath and he was like, oops, oh, I didn't mention. Someone came with me. Goliath, knock yourself out. Because you've already eaten the stone and Jesus was very mindful that he cannot eat the stone. You know where they were? They were in this exact same location that Isaiah prophesied that the church will be until the maker and builder comes to build them up. Isaiah 45, he says the stones will be taken to the outskirts of the city by the brooks. So Jesus was led into the wilderness because he knew that those stones are the ones that he will build with and the devil wanted him to eat them. So we will truly have needs in the body of Christ. And the devil would want us to satisfy our cravings first before we obey the word of God. But God is saying no, the word first. And then every other thing shall follow. So I want to encourage you today. Wake up and begin to fight. Let me tell you something. The best way to prepare or to learn how to fight is to fight. If you look at your life closely, there are battles that need to be fought. You know, some of us are like, well, but everything is going good. My children listen to me. My salary gets paid. You know, I'm even about to pay off my mortgage, you know. You have all these things going for you, you know. But the doctor says I have the body of a 27-year-old, even though I'm 57. You know, so I'm like, I'm healthy, I'm doing this, and I'm doing that. But the enemy is winning the battle of your spiritual preparedness because the last time you read the Bible, you read four verses, and that was four springs ago. So do you not know that you have to fight the battle over sleep? Do you not know that sleep can be an enemy? There are certain times wherein the Satan in some people's life is sleep. The Satan in some of our lives is too much dependence on the news. The Satan in some of our lives can be any one of those things. And God is saying, I want you to fight this enemy. Fight sleep. Jesus commanded his disciples. He says, do not give sleep to your eyes, nor slumber to your eyelids. But guess what? They did, and they were overrun by Satan, and they were wondering what hit them. Sleep hit them. And so I encourage you, begin to practice with those ones, those little things. Fight sleep, fight stinginess. Some of us just need to be a bit more generous toward God and toward men. Many of us, we need to fight some of those enemies, and we don't even know. You think it's just natural because the world wants to convince you that it's your nature. They're like, oh, I don't forgive people easily. That's my nature. I don't let people take advantage of me monetarily. That's my nature. Before I give one dollar to somebody, they need to write a proposal. You know that I've heard somebody say before that nobody ever asks me for money and I just give it to them that same day. I have to sleep over it. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says if your brother comes to you in need of that which you have, do not tell him come back tomorrow. The Bible says do it while it is called today. But they're like, no, it's just my nature. My dad was an accountant and my mom was a bookkeeper. So I pay attention to records. And the Lord is saying, yeah, but those are people in the natural. Don't you want to be more like me, your heavenly father who brings salvation while it is called today? And so fight those things. Fight greed. Fight. There's so, much, so many things to fight. And God did that so that you can walk your way up to the big, big, big boys in battle. If you want to fight for America, a whole nation, and you cannot fight from, for yourself to even sit down and study the Bible without being distracted, you've not even overcome the battle. Your phone is currently winning. When you wake up, the first thing you reach out for is your phone. 
I remember one day I was about to reach out to my phone and the Holy Spirit said to me, he says, you do that every day. I was like, oh, yeah. So shamefully put my hand in my pocket. I walked away from that phone. And since then, I've had my moments when I still went for the phone, but I, I try as much as possible to not make it the very first thing that I touch with the essence of a new day. See, the glorious essence of a new day, let me tell you something that I have learned. When I wake up, the first thing that I do is I put my hand on myself and bless myself. Because what you don't have, you cannot give. If I'm gonna go out in the day and bless other people, how blessed I am to bless other people. Praise the Lord. Let me tell you something. Okay, let's, I see the time now. Let's, let's, let's break bread. So, we're gonna break bread today and I'm gonna just uh, use one scripture. In fact, we haven't even read from Ephesians in a long time. Did anybody know this? Okay, so let's read from Ephesians today. Let's go to Ephesians chapter three, verse one and two, and we're gonna read the very last verse in Ephesians. And I'm gonna show you how those three things connect, and I want you to apply those three things to the word today. One of them to the bread, the other one to the wine, and the other one to yourself. So let's go. Ephesians chapter three, verse one. He says, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. So that's the first one, you apply that to yourself. The Lord Jesus, wants you to live your life totally dedicated to him for the sake of other people. Every time you allow yourself to be constrained, it makes you more positioned or better positioned to bless people. Sometimes I feel like a prisoner in my own house because I want to get out of my room and go do things and the Holy Spirit reminds me that I have not completed my dose of the word for the day. And so I'm constrained, but whenever I am constrained, it is so that I can minister to others. It says, I am a prisoner for the sake of ministering to others. And so let us hold that for ourselves. The other one is for the bread. He says, indeed, if you have heard of the dispensation of grace, of, of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. Let me tell you something. Jesus is the embodiment of, of grace and what did he call himself? He says, I am the bread of life. So when Jesus says, this is my body broken for you, he is saying, I have already given you the grace. Believe in the Lord and believe also in me. You see, when you believe that the grace of God is abounding to you because you have eaten the bread, the grace, there is nothing that God is asking you to do that you would chicken out of because you have already been equipped. So the last one, which is the very last verse of, um, in fact, let's, let's, let's take this thing to, let's go to verse 14 instead of reading 21. Um, it says, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus was going, the reason why they were able to take his life was because he laid it down. He bowed his knees to the Father. He says, Father, into your hand, I commit my spirit. The blood of Jesus is there as a constant reminder in the life of the believer that your life is in his hands. The Bible says the life of an animal is in its blood. So I want you to take those three things today, yourself, the bread and the wine, as we break bread, to say, Lord, let me rejoice in the way that your Holy Spirit constrains me, because that is how I will continue to be useful to you in blessing others. And I want to always remember that. Jesus says, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. I need to remember that all the time so that I don't rush out of the place where God has positioned me to prepare me. And secondly, I have indeed received the grace of God. It is my divine enablement, just like Paul said, to fulfill my call. And so I don't have to stress myself. All I need is that word of God, is that grace of God. All I need is the bread of life, Jesus Christ. So as I eat of the body of the Lord Jesus today, I declare that every part of my being, my memory, my consciousness, and my imaginations, my dreams, will be reminded that all I need is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as Jesus committed himself to the Father, I also bend the knee before the Lord and say, Lord, into your hand I commit my spirit. Jesus says, my life is in my hands and I lay it down. That's how come we have the life of Jesus, by his blood. So let us also say nothing will be too much for me to lay down at his feet. As I drink of the blood today, I remind myself that my willingness is key and I am willing to give it all 
for the sake of the cross. So you may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood. In Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. God is good. All righty. Oh, this is excellent. Yeah, I had only one reminder text today. I'm doing good. Oh, yeah. So this is what we're going to do very quickly. We will rise up and just pray together. Thank you, Alan. And um, if that last part of it could be a message on its own, don't you think? When it comes to recognizing the things that we need to keep ourselves in remembrance of. Let me just share with you a little secret. The book of Ephesians is a very good book because it keeps you in line. Ephesians and 1 Thessalonians, they will keep you in line because they are some of the places wherein Paul said things that we should know and think about all the time. Alrighty, so let us rise up and we'll, and we'll close out the service. Um, if somebody can put up the offering slide, that will be awesome. I know that almost every one of us here, we already know how to give, but it's always good to have that on just in case you want to change your way of giving. The Bible says, honor the Lord with your substance. We do not just worship God with our lips. We also worship God with our substance. Um, so I don't like to deprive any of us that opportunity. So let's make sure that we prepare our offerings. And um, is it okay if I give you three assignments? You know, because Thanksgiving is coming and we haven't even decided, or at least I haven't decided. My wife has decided, but I haven't decided if we're having service next week or not. Because it's customary for us to kind of like take the whole week off. You see what I mean? So which means we may not be here Tuesday next week, but it's not decided yet. But just in case, I want to give you three things to do as an assignment. The only one that I'm going to read to you is Genesis chapter 1 verse 7. Don't confuse that to Genesis 117 that we read today. Okay, 1-7, um, it says, which is kind of like an antidote. The Bible says, Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. Assignment number one is I want you to search scriptures and Google, do whatever you want, to understand the difference between the waters and the waters. You know that earlier on today I was telling you how to differentiate between Temptation and temptation. How to differentiate between answering a fool and not answering a fool. You need to understand the difference between these two waters. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you. And then when we get back, maybe after the Thanksgiving uh, celebrations, we can then talk about it. It's critical. It's one of the ways by which you as a believer strengthen your, uh, one of the ways by which you strengthen your, your, your spiritual muscle. The muscle of your ability to discern. Yeah, your discernment muscle. Those two waters are different. And you need to know why, okay? That's the only one I'm going to read to you from scripture. The other two things that I want to give to you as an example is this. When Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead, but you follow me. What does it mean by the dead? There are two deads there. He says, let the dead, sorry, I'm not pointing to you, Anita. <laughs> he says, let the dead bury the dead. And it's like, if one is already dead, or if both of them are dead, who will bury who? So there are two different deads in that place, right? Good. Now, so that's the other thing. That's the second assignment. The second assignment is this. Two scriptures combined, but I won't tell you where they are. Go find them on your own. The Bible says, for by grace have we been saved, not of works. It is a gift of God. If the Bible says, not of works, lest any man should boast. But the Bible also says that faith without works is dead. Show me your faith by your works. So the first assignment is the difference between the waters above, the waters and the waters. The second one is the difference between what? The dead. Let the dead bury the dead. And the third one is what is the difference between the works? The works that does not save and the works that keep your faith alive. Alrighty, you need to know the difference between the, between the two. So by the time you complete all those three, how many things would you have been able to distinguish between? You would have been able to distinguish how you, between how you answer fools and how you don't, right? And then you'd be able to, you already know now the distinction between one temptation and the other. You need to know these other three. By the time you know those five to start with, you, your discernment will be so sharp I'm telling you, even you will find it that, wow, how did I get here all these days, all, all, the, all this while without being this discerning? 
I'm telling you, it will do you a lot of good. So those three assignments, I gave you help on the first one, Genesis chapter one verse seven. So when you're digging, find the other scriptures. There are about seven scriptures that you need to find in order to be able to understand these things, okay? The one about the dead burying the dead, Two scriptures should be able to let you know one of them in the old, another one in the new. But you see, when it comes to works, you need about three to four scriptures to be able to answer that one. It's a very tricky one. But I believe that God is going to help you by the Holy Spirit. So those three things, I want you to go and attempt to answer those questions and you'll be happy that you did. Alrighty, God is good. Let's bless the offering. Alan, is there an offering basket? Please, let's, let's bless it. If anybody has an offering envelope, that they need to put in there or cash, you can just do that right away so can, we can bless it all together. All right, I'm going to say one more thing. I'm going to hand it over to Alan to bless. But I want to say this. I want to pray over you that you will not stumble. Darkness comes upon, darkness, darkness, darkness comes upon the earth. That's what Isaiah says. And grows darkness to people. But Jesus says there are 12 hours in the day and 12 hours in the night. Those who walk in the day will not stumble. Even when darkness comes, you can still walk in the day. And so I pray for you that in the mighty name of Jesus, you will move, you will live, and you will have your being in the day. You see, Jesus is the day. The Bible says when the new heavenly Jerusalem comes to earth, it will not have any sun, moon, or stars, but Jesus will be the light in the midst of her, and so shall it be forever. So he will be our day forever. So if I live and move and have my being on the inside of the Lord Jesus Christ, I will never stumble. So I pray for you that in the mighty name of Jesus, the enemy will not be able to draw you out to, by questioning your identity. The enemy will not be able to draw you out by any kind of temptation but you will hold fast to the profession of your faith, remaining steadfast in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please help us bless the offering. Father, we give you praise. We thank you so much for what you've done tonight. Lord, we lift up every offering unto you, O God, and we ask of thee, let it be pleasing in your sight. Father, we thank you for this time of deliverance, this time of instruction, of word, O God, how you speak to us. Now, Lord, we give in thanks. O God, we give an honor unto you for what you have done for us. For, Lord, we know it's already yours, for you own the cattle on a thousand hills, O God. Father, we thank you for wisdom. We thank you for revelation and insight. Lord God, we ask that you look upon every seed for your word declares that you indeed give seed to the sower. Oh God, be glorified this night. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Everyone have a blessed week.